The for loop is a looping statement like the while loop that allows you to repeat a block of code many times. In fact, it's a special case of a very common pattern that we've seen with the while loop. So let's take a look at that pattern first, and then we'll explain the for loop in terms of it. So imagine a while loop that looks like this. You've got a counter variable i, it's initialized to zero, and we're gonna loop while that counter variable is less than some number n, which is the number of times we want this block to repeat. Inside of that block, we're gonna repeat valuable code, which here we've just commented it out, but you can imagine something useful is happening inside of this repeat block. And then we have this i++, which increments our counter variable and brings this loop a little bit closer to completion. We can compare the while loop with this for loop, which achieves the exact same thing. We have a counter variable initialization as our first step. We have a condition that is a Boolean expression that will determine whether or not this loop continues to repeat. We have something happening inside of our loop body that's a value. So we have something happening inside the repeat block. And finally, there's this variable increment or variable change step that causes our counter variable to change in some way, bringing this cl loop closer to completion. So these two loops are exactly the same, but there are two things I wanna point out specifically about them. The first, one of the things that's really funny about a for loop is that the variable increment step, it actually occurs in terms of when it's evaluated at the very end of the loop, just like it does with the while loop. So these two loops are exactly the same in terms of how the processor is going to evaluate them. The second important note to make is that this i variable is declared only inside the scope of the loop. So you can access it in your condition, you can access it from this variable change step and inside the body. So to achieve the same thing with a while loop, you would have to surround it in a, another block and it becomes even more cumbersome. Otherwise, this variable i is declared outside of the initial while loop body. So if we take a quick look at the syntax specifically, we have the for keyword followed by an open parenthesis. And then the first thing we have is our variable initialization step. So this is where we're gonna declare and initialize the starting values of any counter variables. We're gonna have our Boolean test next, and these two things are separated by a semicolon. Our Boolean test is gonna be the condition that we'll evaluate to ensure that the repeat block continues to run. This next semicolon separates the Boolean test from our variable modification step. And remember what's interesting about this variable modification step is that uh, it's not evaluated immediately. So if we think about the way this the processor is going to evaluate the for loop statement, first it's going to come and initialize the variables. It's next going to test, hey, is this looping condition true? And if so, it's going to go into the repeat block. After it completes what's inside of the repeat block, it's going to come back up to this variable modification step and change the variable that's counting in some way. Finally, we're gonna go back and we're gonna test again. And so this is where our looping pattern comes from. And this is just the same as you would expect it to work in the equivalent while loop. What's interesting and different about this is that the variable modification step is written as if it were happening right after this Boolean test. But you need to remember that it doesn't actually happen then. The reason why it's there is that it helps us avoid forgetting this step and writing an infinite loop on accident. So let's try actually implementing one of these loops in code and walking through its evaluation. If you'll pause the video here and go ahead and set up this code as instructed, we'll resume in just a minute. All right, hopefully your code looks something like this and we can try running this by saying how many and I'll enter two and we see that zero and one are printed to the screen. Let's trace through this program and understand why this is happening. So we're declaring this variable n, and n is being assigned an initial value of two because that's what we input. So we awaited this prompt, two is being assigned to n. So n is two, and we reach this for loop, and we have a for loop that's declaring a counter variable i, its initial value is zero, right? So this is the first step that happens. The second step that happens is we evaluate is i less than n? So i is zero, is zero less than two? Yes, that is true. So this is the second step that happens. The third step that happens, and what you have to be careful about when you're evaluating a for loop, is that we go into the repeat body. And this is the third thing that happens. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna print i. And i is currently zero, and that's what caused this zero to show up on the screen. It's important to notice that this is zero, right? We didn't already increment i by one. If we had, that would have printed the number one instead. But with a for loop, we evaluate the Boolean expression and then we go into the repeat block. After we complete the repeat block, we're going to go up to the variable change step and increment i by one. So i is no longer zero, i is now one. 
we once again compare is one less than two, that's true. So we go back into the repeat block, we print i, i's current value is one, so it caused this one to print to the screen. And after that, we come back up, we change our variable one more time, i is no longer one, it's now two. We compare is two less than two, that's now false, so we're going to skip over the repeat block and we're done with our program. If we wanted to, we can use a for loop to loop in the opposite direction as well, just like we could with a while loop. So let's say we were going to start for let i be n minus one, while i is greater than or equal to zero, and subtract one from i after each repeat block occurs. And we could print i out here as well. So I'm gonna save this and try rerunning this program. We'll do two as our example input again. And we see we have zero, one counting up, and here we have one, zero counting down. If we can imagine now that the program has completed this step, and we're now on to the next for loop, one of the things to note is that we're able to use this i variable once again and declare it brand new because this i variable, it's scoped within the for loops body. So it's not like these variables conflict with one another. The second thing we're seeing is that i is being initialized to some other value than zero. So n minus one, we enter two, so i is initialized to one. And here we test is i, which is one, greater than or equal to zero, and that's true. So we would enter the repeat block and we print i. That's what caused this one to print out. After the repeat block, we go, we go up to the variable change step, and here we're subtracting one from i. So i is now going to be zero. And once we've done that, we're gonna once again test our Boolean condition is zero greater than or equal to zero. And that's true. So we go into the repeat block, we print i again, i is zero, so that's what caused this zero to print out. After we complete the repeat block, we go back up, we subtract one from i one more time, and now i is going to be negative one. And negative one greater than or equal to zero is false, so we skip past this loop. The variable change step could be something along the lines of this as well. You're free to change your counter variable in any way you'd like from this portion of the for loop. So why use a for loop? The first reason to use it is you're much less likely to write an infinite loop. Because that variable change step is in the exact same line as where you're declaring your counter variable and where you're testing it, it's really hard to forget to accidentally increment your variable or change it in some way. The second reason, which is a little bit more subtle but winds up being useful, is that when you declare a variable inside of your for loop as the counter variable, it is scoped only inside of that for loop. So you're free to write a sequence of for loops, one after the other after the other, that all make use of the same counter variable 